hurry up and get that thing finished. Hello and welcome to Apex Instant Tips, episode number 110, brought to you every Friday at 12.05 Eastern Time. I'm Anton. We have with us today a special guest, Hayden. Welcome, Hayden. Happy Friday, Anton. <laughs> Happy Friday to you. Um, so Hayden, as our viewers know, we um, have one rule. We give a tip in just one five rule. minutes. Yeah, that's our, that's our only rule is we give a tip <laughs> in, in five minutes. Um, and, uh, and then we get them out of here. Um, Rules are made to be broken, right? Yes, and uh, with um, uh, we, we hope that our, our viewers will understand if today, as an exception, we will do a 10-minute check. Because that's <laughs> just a little bit too much content to fit in five minutes. Yeah. Um, so in, in short, um, it, usually we give a tip and we say this is what we think is the best way to do it. Today, we're going to give three methods for um, how, to, how to kick off a dynamic action from a report. And... We'll talk a little bit about why you might use one method or another um, and, and solicit your feedback on what you what your best practice for for this is. Um, yes. And uh, I, I, how about without further ado, uh, we share my screen and not uh, take up more than than the than the 10 minutes we've already threatened to take. OK. All right. So let me put this up here and I'm going to go ahead and launch this. So okay. um, uh, people using Apex should be familiar with this starting premise, which is from a report, you want to launch a dynamic action for, I don't know what purpose, maybe you want to send an email, who knows. But the, um, uh, if you Google uh, instructions on how to do this, you'll find several methods. We're going to exhibit three of them. And almost all of them uh, invoke uh, the, uh, the keyword this. And uh, it is yeah. concepts to work with because it's hard to inspect. That's right. That's right. So, um, so let's go, let's show the first method of what, what folks often will encounter. Um, and that is, uh, to, to create your button, um, with a, with a, an HTML expression. And the key here is two things. Um, it's a special class and because you're going to tie your dynamic action to that class and it's a way to pass data. So tell me about that string that you have highlighted. Yeah. So if you use the data dash method, you can, uh, that is a way of identifying custom attributes for your HTML. And uh, so the idea is that when people click on this button, um, uh, we're, we're going to extract CSTMRID and do something with it. Right. And that's the only truly valid way to do a custom attribute in HTML. You could just do customer ID, but it's not a valid attribute. Data dash is the right way. And you can have multiple. You can data dash customer ID, data dash customer name, data dash customer, whatever it might be in this same method. Right. And so uh, the next step in the instructions that you'll probably find online is to do uh, to have an, uh, an on click um, event that listens for that special class. And, and so then that's a dot. That's a dot and the and the and the class name. So that's right. how it'll kick it off. And then the instructions probably don't stop there. It probably tells you exactly what's right here, but uh, it is it, probably going to be this dot something. And uh, what I object to is that it's often it's sort of treated like a magic formula. Um, the help here uh, gives you, primes you to know there's probably going to be this stuff triggering element, but it's, how do you know? Well, how do you, why isn't it this dot data? Or, or this dot data, exactly. Right. Um, certainly before we uh, uh, launch into uh, one approach, one, um, one thing that you can do to get yourself closer to your target is to uh, inspect the HTML and the DOM go to console and do dollar zero. And from dollar zero, you can probably figure out that, um, that it's dollar zero dot data set dot uh, uh, CST customer ID. And so, that, it, it, you, so you can sort of do it with dollar zero, but it's, it's actually only gonna work for this first, first method. It won't work for the other two. So what is a better approach, Anton? Well, if you want to see everything about it, just in your JavaScript there, you can just invoke the debugger from your JavaScript. So right after you log that, just put debugger and you're going to get a whole bunch of information about the thing that, that caused this to happen. So if we do that and we go back to our, our um, so, right So you here. want your inspector open. And if I now click this button, mm -hmm. um, I can, it's going to open up in, in the sources um, section and we can see that um, in the scope, there's a this object uh, mm -hmm. that I can expand. 
And I, I could spend a long time searching through this. But we can see that this data doesn't have it. It's not in this dot data. It's somewhere else. So it's not in this dot data. Uh, the help uh, mentioned something that triggered an element. Let's inspect that. We can search through this. It might take you a bit. But um, uh, there's something called data set. And here is um, a CST MRID 2. So now we know that to um, uh, console log that particular value, it's going to be this. Oh. Let me just copy and paste it. <laughs> It'll be this that triggering element dot data set dot customer ID. Very yeah. good. And uh, maybe the instructions we're following would have told you that, but now you know how to figure it out yourself. So right. and now, if you if you had multiple things, you can get to to additional data elements that way. Yeah. So what's a, what's another method for doing this? So method two um, is uh, it involves turning this uh, column into a link, mm -hmm. um, and in that link. Um, we pass in uh, instructions to call apex.event.trigger in which we pass in the name of a custom event that we're going to create. And then we pass in um, the customer ID. Right. So we've got so, an array that we're passing as data. Um, and, and so in this case, we don't need this class. We don't need to put the class on anything, but we do need so this custom event. This customer event. And then we're, we're, we're brought here. And so, yeah, so, so now we're left in the same position of what do we do? So, right, same deal. Put debugger in there and see where the data shows up. And so I'm going to click this. It's going to, again, open up in the sources if I expand this. And once again, we have in the scope, we have a this object. And what do you see, Anton? Now I see data is right here. So we actually have our data here. Um, and in this I case, know. it's an array. So our array is going to have one. So we'll have to reference the, the this.data array correctly to get the data out. Um, and once again, I'm going to copy and paste because we have done this earlier. And so it's going to be uh, this.data and then zero because that's where we saw it in the DOM. It's so, the first element, right? Um, so now when we do this, we get And so now we can see that, yes. Uh, it, it, it's going to get the data that I'm looking for. And I'll say the great thing about both of these methods is it gives you the ability to pass a whole bunch of data. You can um, pass this data through. I actually recommend that if you're going to do it, you use the Apex um, JSON stringify to make sure that the data that you're passing is stringified for JSON. But um, and that would be in your query itself. So if you're passing somebody's name, for example, you don't you want to make sure you stringify the 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 uh, single quote in like. I don't know, McPherson or something might have a, a, a quote in there, something like that. Anyway, right. you'll use Apex Stringify. But if you're only passing one value, um, there's a kind of quick, easy way to do it. Yeah. So um, uh, here, once again, you, you can do this as a link, or you can do HTML with like an on-click command. So I see you have an item on the page, P1 item, P1 yes. ID. That's a text item right now, but it could be a hidden item, right? Right. Uh, and then, yeah, so either in the HTML button, you have an on-click event, or in the URL, you can pass in JavaScript, and then you, you invoke the $S, which is the same thing as apex.item set value, uh, and you can pass in the customer ID, uh, and then you can have a dynamic action that is listening to an on-change event against that, um, that item, and then once again, you're here, and how do you find the ID that you set? Right. Well, we already know, right? We could use dollar $V to get the value, but we can use dot debugger as well, right? Yeah. So, um, so let's use the debugger. Yeah, let's let's make it interesting <laughs> for ourselves. Let's find out what is there a way to find the ID from this invocation as opposed to just dollar V. So, um, uh, I'm going to click this again. It's going to open in sources, and here I can see in the this. Um, uh, object, there's a triggering element. And, and that uh, triggering element clearly is P1 ID. And then uh, I have to, I might search for a while to. Um, a long, long time. Through all of this. <laughs> and then don't be dissuaded. You have to click on this ellipsis here. And then finally at the bottom here, I can see value. Yes. So this, that so, triggering element dot value would be the way to get at it. If you didn't want to just 
you know, know that you can use the dollar B or the apex.item.get value. They're, they're synonymous. Um, so we, we have two methods here. Console log this dot triggering element dot value. And of course, there's a slightly more obvious, or at least to this crowd, dollar V V1 ID. That should do it. So we should get a couple of a couple of values logged now when we do this. And try to open my console somehow. Okay, so now when I click this, I, I can see that both um, uh, value extraction methods that we've applied have successfully gotten the ID that I'm looking for. Right, and I'll say just really quickly, as we've noticed, you want to make sure you um, turn off warn on uh, change if if you do this because you don't want to warn that there's been a change to that item. So in that P one ID, this, this could be right. a hidden item. Right, hidden item, it would not be protected and warn on unsafe changes would be ignore. And then the protection would also be turned off. Um, right. Oh, and Hayden, we made it in the time limit by seven seconds. Yes, so we were exactly five minutes over, okay. Right, right, so um, yeah, it's easy to make the time limit when you double the time limit. <laughs> yeah, and, and we promise not to make a habit of abusing our one rule. <laughs> Um, well, with that, I have um, I have a, a very short uh, post tip segment that um, that I'm going to mention uh, because I just came around to it uh, an hour before this this call this this show, and I figured I'll share it really quickly. Um, we've talked a few times about using Oracle Text, and um, that the Oracle Text. Uh, um, how much I like it and, and, and ways to do it. And one of the things we have uh, shown is the convert end user search. So Hayden, I didn't prep you for this, but if you don't mind, could you just open up um, the your your screen one more time and um, go to the, the application attributes. So edit application attributes and um, go to the, the, the Oracle text. I think if you scroll down here, you'll get to the Oracle text. Um, function right there. So if you put a function in here, something that I just noticed is the way Apex builds um, its query, this function becomes part of the contains clause. Um, and this is true whether you do it here. The nice thing is also the global search allows you to do different functions for each global search. So you get, you get to define a different text function potentially for different searches. But in all cases, the contains clause simply puts this text function it does not change it to a scalar subquery, right? And so this function runs for every row that's returned potentially. Right. Okay, so what I have found works and I'm a little bit surprised by it, but if you, if you make this function deterministic, assuming it really is deterministic, that you're not relying on something about the page or something, if this function truly is deterministic, if you, you put the, the keyword de deterministic in there, it does not run every time, um, which is um, maybe maybe version dependent, but it, it I have found that it um, it can you know improve your performance just a little bit. So I recommend that this Oracle text function, whenever you use it, if it can be deterministic, you use the determin deterministic keyword in the function definition. That is uh, very useful to know. So, um, so that harkens back to um, five or six uh, different episodes we've had on Oracle text, probably. Um, Oh, and uh, so addressing Fernando's question, I, I think you now have your answer, Fernando. Th yes, that was just to make it uh, as, um, more uh, clear. Uh, yeah, the, the proper thing to do would make the item hidden um, right. and to... Uh, yeah, so don't make it visible, make it a hidden item. That's yeah. the, yeah, the short answer, yeah. And then, but if you make, make it a hidden item, turn off worn on unsafe changes and turn off page protection. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Um, uh, well, great. Uh, of the three methods, which one is your favorite? You know, I I often use the third one. So that's a so I use the third one if I'm 
trying to, if I'm likely to be doing an Ajax call server side um, call, because I want to put the data into that item and make it easy to send that item back. So mm -hmm. I use the third method and I'm usually only need one piece of data. If I'm doing that, I'm just passing back one ID. And an Ajax call is like probably describing like 90% of use cases. Right. But in the case that I want to do something else that I want to like have some JavaScript and I want access to multiple um, pieces of data, mm -hmm. I use, um, I usually have used the triggering element one, but I kind of like the button one, the more I think about it. Um, so, uh, the triggering, uh, I'm sorry, the, the triggering of a custom event. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm and really on the fence. Clear, oh. all, all three of them could have used the button. We just, Oh, right. Yeah. They, they could be stylized any way you want. Yeah. Yeah. They all could look essentially the same. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I, you know, I, I really am interested to hear what other folks' thoughts are on best practice for this. Um, what about you, Hayden? What's your what's your go to on this? Uh, I, I agree with your um, answer. I, I think if, if you're uh, going to keep it client side, um, uh, no need to set something back to the database. Um, and so, yeah, uh, uh, either method one or two would be the better approach. Yeah. Um, right, especially because then you can pa easily pass a lot, you know, a lot of additional data. Um, yeah. So, um, all right. Well, I guess that has done it. Uh, if uh, will that work for Classic Report as well? Yes, it will work for um, Classic Reports. Uh, I think any report um, that I'm aware of, list view reports. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, I think the only. Uh, the only thing that we did that was specific to the uh, uh, that that was report specific was the invocation of the column as hashtag ID. Right. It's in in some report types, it's ampersand ID dot. In other ones, it's hashtag ID hashtag. So depending on what report type you do, exactly. Um, right. Yeah. But if you but, um, are ex using debugger, that will be made clear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, so I guess um, do all the things if you like the video like the video, um, tell all your friends about it. See you next week. Have a good weekend.